Luke 23, 32. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. Luke 23, 39 through 43. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence. We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. God, thank you so much for this beautiful day, this beautiful sunshine, this beautiful season that we're in. You are here to honor you. Father, um, I just thank you for Dalen, for the words said. You are the truth, the messengers who bring the good news. And today, um, whoever will bring this good news, Lord Jesus, um, you came here and he, by his death, he accomplished the purposes of the law. And if we believe that, we are made right with you. And I thank you so much, Lord. I can't even begin to understand how much you love us. So I pray that, that we will hear these words that Dale is about to give us, hear them with our minds and believe them in our hearts and live them in our lives. Thank you, Lord, and we bless you. Amen. His mission, our mission. Last week we uh, started on a, a series of the seven last words or last statements of Jesus. Uh, you remember I mentioned a book last week entitled The Last Words of Saints and Sinners. And it reminds us that, that the last words many times of persons reveal much about who they are and what was the focus of their life. Today we look at what is historically thought uh, to be the second word. But as we begin, I want to share a, a couple of things because I think it kind of sets the stage uh, for the, the remainder of the sermon. You and I know, or we should know, that Jesus associated with sinners. It's often been said that a person is known by the company they keep. In life and in death, Jesus associated with sinners. If you go back and look at Luke 15, verses 1 and 2, you'll find these words from Scripture. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and scribes grumbling said, This fellow welcomes sinners and even eats with them. Jesus had allowed a prostitute to wash his feet with her tears. Jesus called tax collectors and garden variety sinners to be his disciples. He touched lepers and ate with them. Days before the crucifixion, you'll remember Jesus was in Jericho and as he walked down the street, there was someone who wanted to see him. He couldn't get close enough because he was short of stature and he climbed the tree. His name was Zacchaeus and when Jesus got to the place of the tree where Jack Zacchaeus was, he said, Zacchaeus, come down. I want to go home with you today. If you read a part of uh, the remainder of that story, you'll know that uh, he went and uh, he was sharing a meal with Zacchaeus at that point. In biblical days, if you had dinner with someone, it was saying that you would be able to call them your friend. But Zacchaeus wasn't the only one that was there. He called in his friends, more sinners. The folks who saw Jesus and what was going on were upset, and Jesus said these words, You don't understand, do you? You don't understand do you? The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. We think of those words as we begin looking at some things because that was the mission of Jesus. His mission was to seek and to save the lost, and yet it 
applies to us today as it did then. Not yesterday, not tomorrow, but what about today? Two crosses flanked a central cross, one on the left, one on the right. On those things revealed to us two criminals from the scripture reading. It says they were two criminals. Research would tell you that if you go back and look at the life of these two persons, there's not a great deal known, but uh, they started out with, with great ambition. They were probably uh, thinking that they would find the, the joy of things in life and happiness and all that could be, and uh, they found themselves uh, being drawn in to a part of what they thought was right and just, and they were there to be a part of that group who was going to overthrow the Roman rule. As they participated, the story says that uh, they participated and sometimes they let uh, little things uh, become a compromise of who they were. And little things led to bigger things, even to the point of tor torture and murder for the cause of destroying the Roman rule. It was those things that led them to their own crosses. Part of recognizing and how sad it is sometimes in our own life that, that you and I can find and we see others that good people start out with good intentions, but they lose their sense of moral or religious direction. We think about those thieves. The second word tells us, yes, there were two thieves, two criminals were crucified that day, but also truth was crucified that day. The one who is the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus was crucified. But there's some things that happen a part of that as we look at uh, those thieves and why Jesus spoke these words to one of them in particular. The first thief was one that uh, really threw out an insult. The scripture said that from um, the New International Version, and maybe it says something else in another, but, but it was an insult was hurled at the one who was in, in the middle because uh, thinking that he might be the Messiah. He wasn't sure, but as he offered his prayer to, for Jesus to save himself and to save them, we can be glad that Jesus didn't answer that prayer. It was a request to be saved from death so that he probably would be able to go back and finish the work that he'd begun to take down more Romans. He wanted to be saved from the penalty of sin but only so he might be able to sin again. He cries out, save yourself. And it's almost as if he would say, well, Jesus, save yourself and save us, and then we can talk. Then we can talk about what this means as a part of that. But I want you to know this morning, if Jesus had saved himself, if Jesus had saved himself that day, we all would be eternally lost. The story of King Frederick the Great was traveling through the jails in Potsdam. He was speaking to all the inmates and uh, he was a, a bit surprised because every inmate he talked to, they said they were innocent of their crime. Finally, as he was nearing the completion of his journey among those inmates, one conversation he had with one particular inmate said, King, I am guilty of the charges, and I deserve my punishment. And for some strange reason, with a smile on his face, the king released him from prison and said these words, I would hate for this man to have an influence on all of these innocent people. about a part of our life we're all sinners here today hopefully sinners saved by grace but we're all sinners and we still are, are, have the need in our life of the all-sufficient sacrificial substitutionary atoning death of Jesus for our sin the first thief on the cross that day failed to realize that our prayers and our desires for the kingdom must be focused on God and his will on his will for our lives and not on, on, not on our own self-centered, nearsighted, temporary wants and desires. Let me repeat that. The first
first thief on that day failed to realize that our prayers and desires for the kingdom must be focused on God and His will. His will for our lives, not on our self-centered, nearsighted, temporary wants and desires. But there was a second thief, wasn't there? The second thief was no less guilty than the first thief. But for a moment, a conversation with Jesus, he made a remarkable discovery. He had admitted to the need of his life. Isn't that a part of what we recognize when we come to know Christ is that we must admit our need? He knew that he could not save himself. Secondly, he recognized the pure and spotless and perfect character of Jesus, that he was the Son of God. You might ask, well, how did he, he know that? Well, there's a couple of stories that are written, and one says that, that the man, as he told his story from his perspective afterward, he said, there was just something different about him. You could see it in his eyes. You could sense, even as he was giving his life on that cross, that there was something that was different. And if you go back and think about Jesus being with sinners and tax collectors and those who were the, the reprobates of society as a part of that, they never felt uncomfortable about, around Jesus. They always sensed that they were welcome because that was his mission. His mission was to seek and to save the lost. That thief also recognized that he was, uh, even as Jesus was able and dying, that Jesus had the power, that Jesus had the power to do what was necessary to take him to another kingdom. He doesn't say if. You know, that's not there. If you can, he cries out, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And lastly, this thief was the one person probably who really recognized what was happening on the cross that day and for the reason Jesus was dying. He was going to die for him. How arrogant. How arrogant, most people would say, for a thief, a criminal, one who is going to die for his crime, to ask of Jesus to remember him when he comes into his kingdom. And the, the arrogance is a part of that is sometimes the thing that you and I have trouble with is that Jesus responded with a positive response. What did he say? The thief said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, today, today you will be with me in paradise. It was something only God could do. And dear friends, I want to attest to the fact again, and probably many of you could too. It was nothing but a mighty act of grace. Grace undeserved, unmerited. There wasn't a conversation that Jesus had with the thief on the cross that day and the one who was there as, as a criminal when he asked of that. He didn't ask him. He said, well, before we do this, let me ask you a few questions and see if you can answer these questions for me. Do you believe in the Trinity? Didn't ask that question. Do you believe I'm fully God? Do you believe I'm fully human? He didn't ask that question. He didn't ask him if he had been baptized. He didn't ask him if he believed in the Bible. It was just simply his trust. Trust in someone who he may have heard about but had never come into contact with who also made a promise to him that day. We think about those things as a part of our life. It's sad, but sometimes you and I have been guilty and others have been guilty of saying, well, who deserves the right to get into heaven? Well, they're not worthy even to call on the name of Jesus. Is that not totally contrary to what Jesus said about himself and what the scriptures proclaim to us about who Jesus was? To seek and to save the lost. A part of being reminded is a part of that. We think of those things, and yet we say Jesus' words were... How could he fully understand and give someone that great a gift? As Trace mentioned, it was there. 
he had to receive it as a part of that. And he did receive it because he said something. Do you know what the word Jesus means? The real translation. It means salvation. He called out his name. And basically he was saying, save me. Save me. He addressed the other thief and said, why would you say things like that? We're getting what we deserve. And yet in the midst of that, he turned to Jesus for strength. Note the word paradise. The word paradise is translated many times as heaven. Heaven is a part of that and recognizing is a part of his life when we share that, that this thief who had lived a sinful life of rebellion would now spend eternity in heaven because he trusted Jesus. And the other good thing that's a part of that is he was going to be with Jesus. It says something to us. It's a part of that this today. It says to me, for those of us who've lost loved ones, who have had faith in Christ and lived their life as followers of Christ, the moment that they breathe their last, they fall into the arms of the Heavenly Father and of Jesus' Son for eternity. In a moment. There wasn't this sense of prolonging or this state of, of waiting, this sense of purgatory. It was a part of, Jesus said, today. Not tomorrow, not yesterday, not next week, not next year. But today you can be with me. Jesus offered something in a wonderful way. And sometimes we miss that as a part of our life. But on that last Good Friday, among two thieves, a dividing line was forever etched on Mount, the mountain that's called Calvary. Forever. On one side, a man died with the burden of his sin. On the other side, a man found the grace and forgiveness of God through Jesus Christ. Those same two choices are available today. We can respond to the death of Christ on the cross for our sins, or we can be as the other criminal there. We can walk right on by it and reject it and be lost forever. The cross has two sides. The cross in the middle is what makes a world of difference. And it all depends on which side we stand. Here's an illustration told of a churchman a number of years ago who found himself journeying to the Holy Land and on this particular day was going to the church of the sepulcher, um, which is in Jerusalem. It's a famous site, and it's uh, supposed to be the place of where Calvary was. Down at the end of the, what's called the Via Della Rosa, the road of suffering, it's at the end, but at that place called Calvary. There are three crosses built there over a magnificent altar. And it also has beautiful diamonds and rubies which adorn it. It's something to see. Many people who've made their pilgrimage in their journey to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre have knelt in front of that cross. But this churchman said, he paused for a moment. He said, I was ready to kneel, but then I knew my place was at the other cross. For the penitent thief, uttered his cry that echoed through the ages. Last Sunday, the cross was over here. It was a crown of thorns. It was draped in purple. The crown of thorns is gone, and the cross has moved. The cross has been moved there because I want it today to represent the cross of a penitent thief. And as that churchman today, in our hearts and in our lives, we 
first has to come to this cross before we can go to the other one, the one in the middle where Jesus Christ gave his life. And all we can say, either for the first time or to say again, is Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. We don't have a leg to stand on. in our own goodness and in our own righteousness but only by the grace of God and the love that Jesus gave of himself for the world on that cross that we can hear those words today, tomorrow, next week when time comes you will be with me in paradise story a thousand times but it also took that illustration to remind me this is my cross as Judy said in a prayer we can never fully understand the depths of God's love this thief had no words nothing but in a moment Those words that he spoke gave him the promise of eternal life and to be with Jesus. And there may be somebody here today who's never done that. Or maybe, maybe you've compromised. Maybe you've been distracted from the season of Lent and the true meaning of Easter. Maybe you need to find your place, whether it's here at this altar or it's in the pew or somewhere today in your home. And with heartfelt sadness, deep regret to know that one loved you so much that he gave his life for you and to get back on the right track. If you will confess, His promise is he will forgive you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, the cross is a reminder this day. Not so much of the cross that you were on, but the cross that held a criminal and a thief who recognized who you were who cried out for forgiveness in one sense of the word because he knew that he was getting what he deserved. But he knew that you were perfect in every way, that you were not worthy of what was happening in your life. But he asked that you would remember him. And you made a promise that we've heard through the ages. Lord, and we hear it again today. Today we can be with you in paradise. Lord, we have no idea what heaven will look like. It can be adorned as that cross at the Holy Sepulcher. It can be adorned with silver and gold and all kinds of things. It can be adorned with the saints of the ages, those of our family and loved ones and friends who've gone on before. But as has been said, there'll be one thing that outshines them all. And that will be you. For without you, we would not know the fullness of salvation. That you love us so very much that you gave your life for us. And that you pardon and forgive us when we confess our sins. Forgive us when we've missed the mark. When we've been distracted and when we've made compromises. Let us live with our eyes fixed upon you the author and perfecter of our faith, who freely gave himself as a ransom 
and that our sins might be passed away and remembered no more. Lord, have your will, your way. And in these moments now, as we share in our closing hymn, Lord, may we surrender all to you, not to hold anything back, because you know in this moment, in this hour, in this place, whether we have surrendered all to you or not, and if we haven't, it's a good time. And Lord, maybe we again have done things contrary to your will, and we need to come again this day and ask for forgiveness. Give us by your Spirit the strength and the courage to make the right response because it does make all the difference on which side we stand. The side of the one who would not confess and died with his sin and the one who lives forever with you. We trust you, O oh God, by your Spirit to do what you want to do here in these remaining moments and we offer our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior.